and uh, thank you all for being here. I'm Chad Blair with Honolulu Civil Beat, and all of you, I'm sure, know U.S. Representative Colleen Hanabusa. Thank you for being here. Sure, a little applause is welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Chad. No, it's, it's good to have you here, and I'm going to go ahead and read from the script here. Honolulu Civil Beat is a nonprofit news organization dedicated to cultivating an informed body of citizens, all striving to make Hawaii a better place to live. Civil Beat hosts monthly events, you probably know that, including this one. Know Your Candidates is part of a special five-part series on the gubernatorial race leading up to the primaries, and it's hosted in partnership with the Department of Communications at Hawaii Pacific University. This event is being live-streamed, and it'll be archived on YouTube and Facebook. The format, uh, it's 45 minutes, pretty much one-on-one, -on -one, you and me, with questions. The questions come from Civil Beat, but also from our readers, and then we're going to try and allow about 15 minutes at the end, before six o'clock, uh, for you in the audience to have questions as well. And Mariko, what is the plan for questions? Note cards, is that right? We don't actually have a mic in the audience, but if you see the people with the Civil Beat t-shirt, that's Mariko right there, raise your hand, and she'll come around and you can put your question on a note card, and then she'll bring it up to me, okay? All right, also, be very nice. Audience etiquette is very important. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, Congresswoman, I'm going to actually start with a question that came from one of our readers. We got quite a lot of questions uh, for you, many more actually than Ray LaRue or John Carroll. <laughs> uh, Angie has a poll, questions are still adding up, and so are Governor Egeast, but you had the, the most questions overall. And this one uh, I'm going to start with. You talk about the false alarm so much, and this is the missile mm -hmm. alarm back in January. What would you have done differently under the circumstances? Well, I think the most important part of it is that I would not have started an initiative like that without having a strategy as to what then do people do. As you know, the, the major complaint that many had is that the, it's like, okay, then what do we do? And after it all happened, people were asking us that, what do we, what can we do? If it's a nuclear attack, as what was anticipated, what can we do? I think on the specifics of the 38 minutes, it's really why the 38 minutes. And as you know, I've, I've asked uh, Governor Ige, David, many times, what did you do for the 38 minutes? Because people, people want to know. And, you know, he, he says, well, you know, we corrected things and so forth. But the issue is, what did you do? The one other thing that we already took action on, and, that, and we did this as a congressional delegation, as you may recall, Senator Schatz actually held a hearing on this from the, on the Senate side and, and asked uh, Tulsi Gabbard and myself participate in the hearing. But as a result of that, we have in various forms and various pieces of legislation asked the Department of Defense to actually be the one who takes over that. You know, we have natural disasters and we have that disaster, which was, of course, the, the missiles. And we did not believe that the entity that should be warning the people is HIEMA, that in fact okay. should be Department of uh, Defense. You're right. Uh, now, <clears throat> what would you, though, have done? I know it's hypothetical, but imagine had you been in Washington Place when that happened. It was 8 o'clock on a, uh, or just after 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning, and the governor, of course, did not send out a tweet mm -hmm. right away. There was some question as to whether he knew his Twitter account. He said he did not. But what do you think you would have done? You know, I think that if, and you, I think the, the other fact that's missing in your scenario is, is that he knew within two or three minutes that it was false. And I think the most important thing is that you get to, to the media, you know, and you, you call the stations and you ask them to, to make the announcement. And as you know, there's part of this whole issue is the role of the, the news media. And they have a, I think it's Chris Leonard on the Big Island who was the representative, and there's like a council that actually deals with this. I would have done that immediately. And I don't know if you know this, but from the time it happened, I made appearances uh, on every major television station and to, to assuage as many of the people's fears as we could. When did you do that? Was that, that wasn't during the 38 minutes, of no, course. No, no, it wasn't that followed there, it was following that. But the governor did not appear on television until 1 o'clock right. in the afternoon. No, he did say that the phone lines, it was difficult to get through. There were a lot of people freaking out and taking up the phone lines. Is that a valid excuse for not being able to contact the media? No, I don't believe it is, because I think many of us were able to call. And, and, and I think the media was also very interested in finding out what it is. And, you know, and the, the point is, and if you also look at what the testimony was from uh, General Logan and where he was, he was at Pearl. And the, the real problem, and people may not realize this, the real problem is that 
because of the system, once it triggered, even Pearl Harbor couldn't untrigger it. It's this, this way that it was operating. So that the sirens went off at Pearl Harbor. So I know Pearl Harbor workers who were just trying to get home as well. And even if they knew, PACOM knew, that it wasn't a missile incoming, they could not stop it because of the way the system was designed. Okay. Let me ask you about the governor's leadership after those 38 minutes and the actions that he took following the press conference that day. They include halting the the test. That was no more. Later on, several people in command, including the person who sent the false alert, lost their jobs. Is that leadership? You know, I don't think that's leadership per se, because the leadership is, is not having somebody else take the rap or fall on the sword for you. The, the leadership issue is, is, to, uh, is to tell the people why it happened and how it will not happen again. Not having, well, in, in our situation, the congressional delegation stepping forward and saying, we're just going to have defense do this, and we're going to tell defense they're responsible, and we don't think Hayama should do it. You also do know by the the emails that were released, and I think you may have actually put it online for people to see, that the governor's office then also changed the testimony as to what was going to happen, and that appeared before us. And we have evidence of where they said that, uh, and they changed the role of the governor and what the governor played. And so, you know, there's a, there's a question as to whether that's leadership or not. I think the most important thing to me is leadership is transparency, leadership is trying to build the public trust, and you don't do that when subsequent to everything happening, they find out that they've somehow doctored testimony. Okay. Uh, let me ask one more question about, uh, about the missile uh, testing alarms. There's a new television commercial that's out and getting a lot of play right now. It's coming from a super PAC that is spending a lot of money to get you elected governor. It's, uh, they're called Be Change Now. They're associated with the Carpenters Union. And the TV spot is called 38 Minutes. And I'm wondering what your reaction is to that ad and what you have to say about attack ads in general coming from people that are supporting you, even though you are not directly involved with that ad. Well, as you said, we're not directly involved with the ad and people who, who do that are no different than the ones that are running for David Egan. You know, they're, they're actually taking his actual ads and putting it on the television and then putting an attack part in the end. You know, there, there may be monies that, are, that people are attributing to Be Change Hawaii, but what I haven't heard people do is to add up all of those other IEs that are putting up the same ad. And that, to me, is, is also an issue. I think that, that the, the problem is Citizens United, as we all know, but the law permits it, and it also prohibits us from having any contact. So sure. I have no contact with But this it. is a super PAC that you must be familiar with, and it's a former iteration, it was PRP, and of course it helped uh, defeat Ben Cayetano in the mayoral race against Kirk Caldwell. Ken, ben Cayetano is now supporting you, and PRP had to pay a lot of money for the settlement after that issue. But do you I, think do you have a position, is it your responsibility to denounce ads that are negative attacking your opponent? There's a difference between negative ads and ads that are truthful in what it says. So what you're really asking me if is I should take a position against Beach. By the way, I didn't even know who Be Change was <laughs> until until the, the uh, uh, Be the, Change. Now I hope I got it. They, they too had a previous name that's different. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah. So so back to your to your question. I do not believe that it's my place to say something to an entity that is relaying a factual situation. If it was unfactual, then I think that that's, that's something else. But in this case, they are expressing their First Amendment right on a situation okay. that was factual. Like the ads that they're, they're doing against me, which talks about the $75 million Colina tax credit, which anybody knows it's misleading because of the fact that no one got the $75 million. But the impression that it leaves people is somehow people got $75 million. And the other thing that people don't also realize is that Koalina's major landholder is somebody who has benefited Hawaii a lot, and that's the Weinberg Foundation. But they did not get $75 million. And I don't hear anybody saying, well, I think that's misleading, because that's not what 
happen. They did not receive it. Uh, let's move on. More questions from our readers. What would you do to ensure Hawaii continues to lead on climate change initiatives? This is something the governor feels that he has a leg up on you. He feels like he is moving the state in the right direction. How about you? What would you do to lead us on climate change? You know, climate change is, there's, there's different aspects of it. And I don't know if you remember, Chad, but actually in 2007, in 2007, we passed the Greenhouse Gas Emission Task Force. You remember that? It was it Oh, was you're really, testing me here, Colleen. Yes, <laughs> and that was during the time I was present. The reason I remember that, I don't remember if Jeff was with Blue Planet at that time. Jeff Michalina. Right, but he was, he was the one who kept seeing me and said, we have to pass this. Hawaii became the second state to do that. And one of that, one of the initiatives was not only that they would do a report in 2010 to the legislature as to what and how they were going to view the greenhouse gas emission standards, but also the part two of the bill was to actually set the standards that we were going to work towards. And the standard was to be at the 1990 level. So those were things that we did. And, and, and as you know, 2008 is where we have the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative coming up. And I really do believe that credit must be given where credit is due. And you see the results of that recently. I think you were there at Washington Place, where you call it the, the uh, Emerson Collective or, and, and also the uh, Elemental Accelerator. Now, a, a critical person in both of those entities is Andrew Karsner. And Andrew Karsner was the the, the actual a Democrat, but uh, part of the the Bush administration that negotiated the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative with Linda Lingle, and I was a part of that because I played a role as Senate President. And in addition to that, we of course have Sustainability 2050, which does all of this. Well, and, and if I may, where the question I think is going forward, you're saying that you do have some good credentials in terms of your track record. Some people, including Civil Beat, have raised concerns about donations you've gotten from Nextera Energy, the Florida company that was trying to buy Hawaiian Electric. There's a concern that you have differences of opinions regarding uh, LNG in terms of a bridge fuel. Mm -hmm. for the state as it moves to renewable and so forth. Do you think you should be accepting those next era donations or should you give them back? No, I, I believe that if they want to give a donation that we're going to, we accepted the donation and, and that's what it is. But I don't know why they would give me a donation because you remember during that same period of time when the Nextera and the uh, HECO or Hawaiian HEI transaction was going through, I was part of the board of Hawaii Gas and we opposed that initiative and we actually they probably were the uh, most I think well-funded opposition to the next era HEI. Okay. Governor Ige your opponent very vocally said that he did not want next era to, to have this deal go through the PUC I believe under his watch turned them down might that not be a reason why next era would give you money? No I don't think so I think that I think what they're going to look at is is whether or not you know someone like me would be quote fair in any analysis, but I think that I don't know why they would give me funds because of the fact that I was part of the board. And, you know, with Colbert Matsumoto is also a mem board member with me. And we were very adamant about the fact that we opposed that deal. And, I, you know, with a PUC, it's a quasi-judicial situation. So they, they had to have evidence before them that opposed it. And I think that we paid a critical role in presenting Where are evidence. you now on LNG, on liquefied, I hope I get the acronym correct, liquefied natural yeah. gas, right? Where do you stand on that now? I feel LNG is a bridge fuel. Not to, to in any way interfere with the 2045, 100% renewable. But what I don't understand is why we would burn fossil fuels at the rate that we're burning, and especially now when you look at what's going on on the Big Island, where you can have an LNG as a bridge fuel, I'm not saying it's anything more than a bridge fuel, as a bridge fuel that has a 50% emission less than fossil fuel and costs 50% less. And the reason is, I think one of the groups that are missing in, in this discussion are the consumers. And how much is it going to cost the consumers? I've had discussions with the former consumer advocate who also opposed the merger, and that's Jeff Ono. And, and he has said very clearly to me, we can go 100% renewable today, but they said, who's going to pay for it? Mm. And you know, I'm from Waianae, and I look at my former constituents, and they're, 
they can't afford this. They can't afford, I'd love for them all, and if I had my way, I'd, I'd make sure that we had a easier access and they would have abilities to call upon PVs or, or solar, as we used to call it, and, and be able to cut their costs. Yeah. But right now, they, they okay. don't. Family ran a, an auto repair store, gas store, too, as I, we, I remember. We were the first gas station on the Waianae coast. Okay. A uh, Chevron <laughs> gas station, if you must know. Next question. Let's shift to education. Again, coming from our readers, uh, your plans uh, to support education in Hawaii, both lower and higher education. And I wondered if you might just drill down to maybe a specific thing that you would propose for either K-12 or for the public uh, universities here. You know, first of all, I believe that the public university system and, and uh, people who know that what I did before I left for, for Congress the last time was to see that UH West Oahu gets uh, built. And, uh, and, and the reason why is because I believe that that was so essential for, the, for especially the Native Hawaiians as well as the, the Filipino Americans and all people on the west side. And it did what it was supposed to do in the sense that the population of that campus is about 26.4% Native Hawaiian, 14% Filipino, and it is concentrating on the, the really the, the types of jobs that you would, that many of them are seeking. And in addition to that, and this is something that I think the the millennial generation would appreciate, a lot of the courses are now taught online so that you can get a UH West Oahu degree and be on a neighbor island and not have to commute to a campus situation and still get the, the benefit of that education. So I think that the second the college level education should be accessible to as many as possible. So uh, are you saying that you would like to increase this kind of use of technology to interconnect the islands? Okay. Of course. And, and that's, that's that. higher education we're that's talking about. Education. What about DOE? DOE is... Uh, you know, I was having a discussion with someone because, as you know, uh, the, the legislature went back and forth on whether or not DOE members, uh, the Board of Education, should be appointed right. or they should be elected. And after trying, I don't know whether it's three or four times you were there, we kept putting it on the ballot and it got rejected. And finally it passed where they would be appointed. And the idea was that the Board of Education, which constitutionally, by the way, as you know, sets the policy of the Department of Education, that they would be appointed and they should reflect the sentiments of the governor because they are his appointees. I personally believe that it, it, it may not be working as well as we had hoped. The, the appointed board, board rather than the elected board. Right. Are and you I, saying I you might revisit that? No, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the, I, I didn't believe the elected board worked, and I'm not sure that the appointed board works as well. I'm, I'm just wondering whether, given the number of students that we have, whether or not the superintendent of education and the DOE should really be a department and should report directly to the governor. Okay, is it fair to say that this is something that you would revisit and come up with some ideas on what you exactly. think? Exactly, Okay. because I think that's the problem. And, the, and then the other problem is because when the, we have the present structure, it's one size fits all, and it can't. You don't learn the same way on the Waianae Coast as I believe you learn in Kahala. I mean, you just learn differently, and you've got to incentivize and, and excite the students, and I don't think we do it if we expect them to all be taught the same Speaking way. of education, speaking of the legislature, there's a ballot question mm -hmm. uh, in November on a constitutional amendment. Should we amend our constitution, and I want to read it correctly, to impose a surcharge in residential investment properties to help fund public education. This came at the request of the, the teachers union. Uh, and I read your response both in the Star Advertiser and Civil Beat. I think generally you're in, you're in favor of these ideas, but I think you raised a minor concern about how that enabling legislation would come about and how that tax would be assessed. You even said that same body that is criticized for failing to appropriate sufficient sums to public education would actually be coming up with the, with the mechanism here. How are you gonna control that if you get into the governorship, if this ballot gets passed? Well. 
you have to real that's exactly the problem okay. so usually our constitutional amendments does come with an enabling legislation and where the governor is not able to have a say or an impact on anything that's on the constitution the legislature passes it in one year by two-thirds votes or a majority for two years and then it gets on the on the ballot the governor does not have a say however where the governor does have the say is in the enabling legislation okay. so if there's something in the enabling legislation that doesn't fit or doesn't do what we expect it to do, then I think it's incumbent upon the governor, in that case, if it was me, to, to veto it okay, and you, to explain it. You would submit the budget, House and Senate would send it back after they tinker with it. What if you saw in there, oh, they're dipping into that money and sending it to the general fund? Is that something you would say, no, I'm not going to allow for that. The voters passed a ballot initiative here. Well, you know, the interesting thing that uh, Hawaii has that the thank goodness President Trump doesn't have <laughs> is this thing called line item veto. Mm. So when it comes to matters of money, the the governor can line item that specific provision because it doesn't do what the governor anticipates that it is. So yes, that is something that the governor can exercise. However, that is something that's unique to Hawaii. Okay. So. Uh, next question, also from our readers. Please talk about your plans to address the housing shortage and the escalating cost of housing. You know, I think that the housing shortage is one that uh, you hear all these uh, these quote unquote these numbers that have been thrown out, and in particular by Governor Ige. And the main problem is that one thing we have to discern is: Are we talking about affordable housing? Are we talking about affordable rentals? Are we talking about kupuna housing? What what kind of housing are we first talking about? Veterans housing, for example, that's that's also an issue. And we also have to recognize that when we talk about the different problems that we have or uh, that it doesn't seem to be penciling out, it's because of the fact that I believe that you cannot begin to sell assets for housing, for, especially for the affordable rentals. You know, about 1,200 has been sold off and the Kapuna housing issued we all know what happened in Kaka'ako where that's probably one of the reasons why the legislature actually increased the rental housing trust fund because there needs to be money to subsidize those poor kupunas who had their their uh, place sold from under them and then having the developer come in and raise the rents so when we talk about that we need to address each segment okay and that makes sense to uh, try and decide what's appropriate right. for each which each right. uh, earning group if you will but what would you do your your newspaper ad today says you will and i'm quoting quickly put the legislature's new 500 million dollar funding into action give me an example of what you would do to put that into action you know first of all the 200 million is the uh, is the uh, uh, the rental housing trust fund right so and this the, is the 500 million figure which includes right. the three the 200 million is that and yeah. uh, what we would need to do with with that is to make sure that we can keep housing in that category and you know and I have experience with that I don't know if you remember do you remember Kukui Gardens yeah sure yeah Frank so, Fossey had a little trouble there <laughs> if I remember correctly no 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 that's not the that's one. not the same one that's not the same ones that's Kukui Plaza. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, Gardens Plaza. Good catch. No, no, no. Kukui <laughs> Gardens is different. Kukui Gardens is as you come into downtown Honolulu from Dillingham and, and basically King Street and they merge. Then it's that parcel right there between uh, Vineyard and, and, uh, and King and Baratania. And near Ala Park. Near Ala Park. And so if you remember... Oh, it was towards the end of the Lingo administration that the Clarence uh, Ching Foundation had complied with the 30-year requirement to keep it to keep it affordable rentals, and then could convert to at that time could convert to market. And we said we can't lose these units. So what we did was we purchased half kept it in the state's control that purchased the actual title and turned over the operations to a to another nonprofit so that we could keep 800 people in Chinatown 
in housing. You know, so an example of something like that would be what we would be looking for. So with that, that money from the legislature, that's something that you would try and do? Of course. It sounds like that might take a while. Well, not necessarily if they are, there are units available to be, quote, converted for that purpose. Okay. And the five, of course, it'll, some of it will always take a while, but then it's not, it shouldn't be. The other, the other thing we have to, we have to look at is, and when you talk about entities like HCDA, and Department of Hawaiian Homelands. You know, when we talk about housing, Department of Hawaiian Homelands is also a major player, and they haven't built. And when you think about it, that's something that you can do immediately because there's 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 really questions about. Actually, DHHL is on my list here, and as we know, there's a waiting list. I don't know what the latest figure is, but it's in the Depends. thousands for people thousands. trying to get on on these homes, and it's been going on for decades. You said there's something you could do right away what is that that you could do right away because it's it has stumped other governors well there's there's 200 lots uh, available and have been available for four years and there's no reason why it shouldn't have been built i understand there's maybe some stick going in the ground now but you know it's, some stick going in the ground i'm in sorry other words, they're maybe building some of the homes now oh, i see okay but for four years it was left vacant that's my understanding. But we would be able to, you'd be able to. So you're saying these lots are being underutilized right now that you could right. jump on that right away and you would of course appoint a director and I believe an assistant for a DHHL. That's something that the governor has not done, Governor Ige. Well, no, he has he has appointed somebody. But oh, it, no, not <laughs> that, but actually taking advantage of those vacant lots. Well, not only that, but DHHL, because of its unique situation, it is a federal program now with rules, specific rules, enacted and, and making it very clear about our fiduciary duties and also the fact that the federal government has fiduciary duties that you could build you could build because i would contend that the the county's laws don't really apply to dhhl or the hawaiian homes lands because of its unique circumstance in that it is federally mandated and incorporated in our constitution. That's the one thing that when we became a state, we promised the federal government in our compact called the Emissions Act that it would be part of our constitution. So if you look at the Hawaii revised statutes, what you will see is there really isn't a quote, Department of Hawaiian Homelands. There isn't, OHA is chapter 10, but you don't have Department of Hawaiian Homelands or Hawaiian Homes Commission. You do have a commission though, right? That oversees. That's yes, right, right, but that's part of our constitution. Right, it, it would, is it, can a governor really have much sway over a commission over what GHHL does? Right now, he should, or she should, because of the fact that it is something that has been approved that the commissioners are appointed by the governor. Okay, back to housing for a moment. You said in Hilo the other night, I was at the debate with you mm -hmm. and the governor and two of the Republican candidates. Um, I hope I got this right, but I, I think you said to the effect, and correct me if I'm wrong, that millennials, younger generations, don't want the large houses that we have, and then maybe they actually prefer something smaller for whatever reason. I think you even said mm -hmm. it might be a lifestyle choice. Expand on that a little bit. I was, wh where did you hear that? From the millennials. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the reason why is because, you know, I, I, I'll be perfectly candid with you. Millennials kind of scared me because I don't understand them. <laughs> they and, scare me too, yeah. actually. One of them is running the camera I know back they're, there. They're, <laughs> and, and, and it's because they really do have a different value from what we are accustomed to or what we think. I, I was in uh, Maui the other day and having a discussion with a, with a young millennial who I sort of took under my wing when we were in Washington, D.C., and he works for Booz Allen and does all these wonderful things. And his father and mother were talking to me with him there, and they were saying, well, what, you know, we don't understand him. And I said, it's because, I, said I, I understand, I was there. I said, we have to listen to them and see what it is. So one of the, the millennials will tell you, for most part, that it's a lifestyle situation for them, and they don't need a four-bedroom house and a two-car garage. They're perfectly... Happy. What about when they have kids? Well, you know, I asked them that question. And they just feel that they may need a larger unit, but they, it's a lifestyle. They want to be have a park. They want to be able to take the children down. But they don't need to have, in other words, they don't want to be a slave to a mortgage. <laughs> I guess that's the best way to put it. Okay. They say, we don't want to be like you guys and you work on, on a mortgage. All we right. want to pay a reasonable percentage of our pay 
to it, but we do not want to be a slave <laughs> to it, like our generation is. So we've got to change our mindset, Chad, or else we're not going to be there for them, and we're going to lose them. I'll agree with you on that point. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question about uh, housing. And before we move on, uh, the legislature again appropriated uh, $30 million for Ohana zones. Mm -hmm. Governor Ige has been somewhat resistant. His administration says that's not necessarily the best way. You said you're going to jump on that. What's the first step to put that $30 million in place? And if I understand correctly, it's six. Uh, basically a shelter that the state would operate. I believe it's three on Oahu and then one each on mm -hmm. the, the, the next largest islands. You know, the, what would you do? The, one, you'd have to, you, we have to find the shelters. And I, and I think that the, the whole idea behind the Ohana Zone is not only a shelter, but also a place where they can have the necessary services. And in other words, if you don't have the services that they need, because most of the ones who would be probably covered by the Ohana Zone, because we have, like housing, we have different kinds of people who have different needs in terms of, of being homeless. It would be what some people refer to as the chronics. It, was, it would be those who have different challenges, like whether they be mental health issues or whether they be drug or alcohol issues. And they issues. don't necessarily want to abide by the rules. Right. They don't want to abide by the rules, but what, you, what needs to happen is they need to have a place where they can have the necessary services. That's how I view the Ohana Zones. Okay. I, I, in fact, I'm just, if, I, if, you, if I may, the, your Civil Beat Q&A, you actually said you're going to actively partner with the counties uh, to remove barriers and facilitate the construction of those those zones. What barriers? Well, if they if they start to say we need, um, you know, you need to be zoned in a proper area because a lot of these probably these Ohana zones are going to come up in in places like uh, in the rural areas because usually like my community, you know, they've always been generous. I don't want them to take any more, but you know, they've uh, like. They, they have been generous in terms of providing for people. But the respective counties, wherever they may be, may try to impose different kinds of regulations on the Ohana Zones. So we need to ensure that the Ohana Zones can come up okay. and be functioning without their regulations on top of it. You're going to call the mayors, you're going to call the county council members and say, look, I want to make this happen as fast as possible. Yes. What about NIMBY? I mean, we've had some challenges. Kona had a temporary shelter that Harry Kim tried for a while. We don't have a lot of Dwayne Carissos in the world mm -hmm. to set something up, up on Nimitz, and the state is only so big. How would you counter that? That has stopped uh, housing projects in some neighborhoods. You know, I, I think that... Uh, shelter in this case. Yes. I think, I think a lot of the, the, the problems is how it's done. And I really believe in going into the community first and just and explaining to them why and why this particular location. I think the other thing that we need to do, and I think people are willing to live with it if they see an end. In other words, if you say, this is our plan, but we need to have it here because we need to build some kind of transitional or permanent structure. We hope to transition them in there. You know, the other component of this that I think hasn't gotten enough uh, attention is the role of the courts. So the courts has a community outreach right. court, right? And they've been rather successful in getting people to either return to families or actually go into shelters. And, and maybe it's because they have the big stick you know people are looking at potential but they're not treating them as criminals but they're giving them a way for them to rehabilitate into the community so your point is that you would want to enable to enhance that we would like to have that outreach uh, to okay. have that so that's why in order to address this specific issue it's just not one solution got it we have to have many solutions. thank you we're speaking with u.s representative colleen hanabusa a democrat running for governor we're at the halfway point just after seven we started a little bit late i misspoke earlier because i was thrown off by the time change uh, we'll go to about 7 35 i've got about 15 more minutes of questions and then i'm going to turn it over to you and again if you do have questions please raise your hand and hopefully our civil beat, uh, Mary Ko Chang, will come around and have you write it on a note card, and then I'll read the question. All right, let me go on to house, uh, homelessness, an issue related to housing. Not the same, but, there, but they are entwined. Your website, uh, your campaign website says, I will not allow us to hide behind dubious statistics that say homelessness is getting better when our own eyes tell us it's not. Civil Beat, May 9th, quote, Hawaii saw a 9.6% decrease in its homeless population 
as compared to a year ago, end quote. That was the point in time count. Is that a dubious statistic? No, I don't think it's necessarily a, a dubious statistics. I think what I'm talking about there is the fact that, you know, some will say, well, we're doing a good job because we're reducing it all the way. But it's not being reduced. And not reduced to the point that you can say, we don't need to address it anymore. Because even at 9%, whatever that may be, we're still per capita the highest. Right? There's 7,000 some on, and I think the nationally we're still the highest per capita of homeless. It certainly is not a problem that has ended, but this statistic uh, is indicating that we made an almost 10% correction on this, and the governor, that was under the governor's watch. Well, but you know, it depends on who, who counts, and the reason I say that is I, I'm a function, I grew up in Waianae, so one of my greatest fears also tied to Ohana zones is that people after a while disappear. So it depends on how you count the homeless and where you're going to get that statistic. So depending, because you know, you can't just say, okay, everybody who's homeless, raise your hand today. You know, you have to go out and I understand, and it's a very difficult problem, and I recognize it's a moving target. Is that a dubious statistic, point in time? I, I think, I'm not, I'm not insulting you. <laughs> I'm just saying that whoever provided that 9% the, is, yeah. is, is, the, is, is you gotta go to the source. Understood, and the governor is running on a, a campaign platform Form that in part says I help bring down homelessness in this right. state. But you know the question is, I mean, do you feel it's getting less? I I don't. Okay. I don't feel it's getting less. I don't feel, and I don't feel people out there feel it's getting less. Okay. We feel that it's being swept from one place to the other. But just because you're able to sweep it from one place to the other doesn't mean it's getting less. Okay, rail, a topic I know that's yeah. close to your heart. Oh, yes. Uh, the st <laughs> state, as you know, has a greater role in oversight of the project, the legislation right. that was passed, which now includes the TAT as well as the GET. There's a state auditor mm -hmm. that is examining the project, already fighting with the heart board. You, of course, served on the heart board. But here's my question for you. Um, you were on uh, PBS the other night with the governor, and you actually have this on your website, and you said that David Ige said he would support an indefinite extension of the general excise tax for the Honolulu Rail Project. And that's a direct quote that's on your website. So I checked out the PBS tape, I called Daryl Huff, mm -hmm. and the question from Daryl Huff was, uh, would you support extending the rail to Manoa, and if so, how would you pay for that? And, and the governor said, yeah, I, I would like to see it extend to Manoa, I would like to see it extend to Waikiki, asked about the surcharge, what would he do? He said in extending it indefinitely was one of the options. Is that right. the same thing, one of the options versus will extend indefinitely? I, I think what he did say was that it was, it was an option. And I didn't he hear did it. He did say that. I, and it wasn't something that, in, when I heard it, was limited to Manoa or Waikiki. Those were, those were being thrown out, but I did not hear that as being the limitation. I heard him as saying that to pay for rail, that extending it indefinitely was an option. And I don't think I've ever said that it was anything other than he said it was an option. My position is that I do not believe it is an option because they Got do that. not Got that, and you said that. there will not be a blank check for it, but right. he, isn't that something a leader does and says, look, that's, that is an option. There are other options too, which is we're just gonna stay at Ala Moana. We may not even have enough money to get past Middle Street and so forth. Is that a mischaracterization of his position? I don't believe it is because I've never heard him say that there needs to be any kind of accountability. And if you notice from what the, uh, I think it was Scott Psyche's interview, Scott Psyche has said that you know, he never participated in this whole discussion. He never looked at whether or not uh, how rail was going to impact the finances or, or in this particular case, whether they were being responsible, both the city and heart in the expenditures. So I feel that when, it, when I heard what Governor Ige said, he was saying that for, the, for rail, that it was uh, an option to look at an indefinite GET extension. Okay. And as you know, that is, he's- um, You're saying that should not be an option. It should not be an option, because it's, it's ignoring the critical part of what has brought us here. And that's the one thing I can say as a member of HART. The one thing that people will, who watched it will tell you, when I was on HART, and especially when I was chair, we had such long meetings, people were getting angry with me, because, but I wanted people to recognize what was going on. You know what, 
the most expensive part of, of the rail project that really the engineers at heart refused to acknowledge and told me I was wrong was the undergrounding of lines. And we know that that 1.6 mile on Dillingham Boulevard is gonna cost at the minimum about $700 million yeah. where they set aside only 70. Those are the kinds of things that you need to understand as to the Thank cost you. of rail. Uh, Speaker Psyche, of course, supporting your campaign. Um, Isn't it odd that they all <laughs> seem to be? <laughs> uh, they more than seem to be. They have actually held a fundraiser <laughs> in your name and raised money for and your campaign. And the question is why? <laughs> uh, they think, uh, well, they, they can answer for themselves why they think you're the, the better candidate. But speaking of another person who's supporting your, your campaign, uh, the majority leader in the House, Della Al-Baladi, uh, she sent out an email via uh, your campaign. It was authorized by Hannah Busa for governor, and, and I'm just going to read to you what she has to say. By the way, it's, a, it's a, a request for donations to your campaign. Quote, it's a flat-out double standard. Women who speak up for what's right are too often told to sit down and shut up. And now Colleen's opponent, David Ige, is uh, using that double standard to try to silence her valid critiques of his leadership. I'll go on to say, from Della Albalati, he recently launched a TV ad to spread this baseless attack to voters across our state and countless women who've been there uh, before and are standing with Colleen to fight back. Is that what David Ige did? Is he telling women to sit down and shut up? This is what Della is saying. But it's on your email, Hannah Booster for governor. Well, you know, I, I will tell you, I do believe that women have had a very difficult time as somebody who has run for office. There is a double standard. We have to, to do this very fine line between being tough and being critical. And you know, as a governor, if you're a governor, you should be able to stand, you should be able to stand, quote, what you may consider to be criticism, because it's your record. That's what you're running on. You can't expect people to ignore that you have this record and when somebody calls you on it, like for example, whether or not you've been honest about the number of houses you've built, you have to be able to defend yourself. I defend myself, and I'm not even the incumbent. I keep having to remind people, no, I am not the incumbent. I understand that, but your email account is being used to say, to strongly suggest that this governor has really been demeaning toward women. What's an example where Governor Ige has demonstrated a disrespect for women? I can't. I'm asking you to come up with an example that would illustrate what this email is saying. Whenever women, or, or in this case, I was accused of being too critical of his administration. And that's what I can't understand. Why is it that I am not able to criticize what he has said? And in this particular case, the, the way it's worded is, is Della's words, not my words. I understand. But do I feel that women yeah. have had a difficult time? Yes, I do feel that. And I feel that, do I feel that the governor's uh, been unfair about it? Of course, because he's saying that being critical is not leadership. Being critical is part of leadership because what that does is it points out to the people what the deficiencies are. I don't understand why uh, somebody who's been governor for four years can't stand the heat, so to speak, okay. of being asked these hard questions. Understood. We Having have an obligation known you to for that. a long time, I don't think anybody's ever been able to tell you to not speak your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. But having said that, <laughs> neither do I appreciate somebody who's going out there and saying that speaking my mind is not a sign of leadership. Right. And that's what the issue is. Okay. Uh, all right. We'll move on. We have questions that are coming from the audience, and I will start reading them to you now. How would you address the shortage of medical doctors? Uh, that's particularly a problem in the rural communities. Right. And as you know, we had a conversation on this at, on Hilo. You know, the, uh, the doctors themselves on the neighbor islands are very concerned about that. And I think one of the best ideas that I heard from them was, what about a unique situation of making like UH Hilo, I mean UH Hilo, I mean Hilo Medical Center, a training campus for doctors? And the reason why, they may have some, I think, family practice residency there, but to make it a, a situation where all the different disciplines can go. And there are 
I became aware that the, some UC campuses are willing to to uh, the University within, of California right University of California campuses are looking at it on the Kona side there is a program that the University of Washington is looking at and they're looking to house it at Nelha which comes up with not necessarily doctors at this time but medical practitioners that they feel they can they can actually facilitate there but but the reason why is because people who do residency this is a statistic that they say that tends to stay in the area but more importantly than that if you can do if you're from the area and you can do your residency there you have a likelihood of staying there so that was one of the programs that the doctors are are actually on their own trying to facilitate they're also looking at scholarship programs where funding a doctor to that I and mean, we've had different versions of it as you know the native hawaiian education uh, act has basically funded doctors if they would go and serve in Native Hawaiian, first of all, that, and also serve in underserved areas. And I think all of these have to be looked at. And in addition, if we can waive the, the, the tuitions and waive the payback on the loans, those are all critical aspects that we have to explore. But the main one that I really am excited about is the training hospitals on the neighbor islands okay. because that gives the opportunity for them. Hawaii is, again, coming from the audience, Hawaii is looking to build a $650 million new prison in Halava. Of course, there's a challenge with OCCC, the capacity shipping our prisoners to Arizona. Here's the question. What criminal justice reforms are you in favor of to reduce our jail and prison population rather than just put them in, in jail? A bail reform is suggested, sentencing reform, parole reform. You know, I think there's, first of all, there's a difference between jail term and prisons. So I have, um, I told this, I think, to Peter Carlisle when he was prosecutor. I said, you know, on the mainland, jails are within the jurisdiction of the city and counties, or the counties, because I feel that when you do that, and it's on their budget, they will comply with speedy trial, and they'll get the, get it through. So then the, the issue of jails becomes a different scenario than prisons. And OCCC is a jail, not a, a prison. When you become a prison situation, I think one of the main things that we have to look at, and, and I, I, I think you were there when we started to reform the whole issue of crystal meth. Before I was in office, crystal meth was viewed as uh, such an evil thing, <coughs> excuse me, sure. that people were actually put in jail and incarcerated versus allowing them to rehabilitate. Well, I guess, and that's the question they're saying that shouldn't we actually be pushing in this direction, and not just crystal meth, but marijuana and other drugs, essentially for nonviolent crimes, and yet we got a lot of people that are locked up, particularly under our current prosecutor, for these very reasons. Do you support what's known as justice reinvention? Of course, and 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 I think that one of the examples of that is the whole program. Have you remember Steve the whole Alm. program? Steve Om. Steve Om. Judge Om. Steve Om. I was judiciary chair when Steve Om came, and we said it was such an important thing. We funded it, a hundred percent. And now Steve Om is the czar of the whole program, <coughs> and he's in Washington D.C. That's right. promoting it. Uh, please, uh, <coughs> Congresswoman, have some water. <coughs> uh, but anyway, you would like to see uh, the course. whole program expand on something like that? I or in other areas, you know, we have them with veterans. Because another thing right? that was brought up is we need to, to really reform the parole system because there's a lot of folks that are just spending too much time either in jail or in prison. So, okay. That's right. All right. Two more questions that I have from the audience. Uh, what changes to the state of Hawaii procurement process? Mm -hmm. Ooh, procurement process for professional services would you make, if any? Uh, and then there's a related question to that as well. But procurement, boy, that'll, that's a tough one. What would you do with that? There's a complaint that it's too slow, that it sometimes favors the wrong people, and other problems of that nature. Your thoughts? Uh, DAGs I, would run it, correct? Well, I think that's, uh, well, there is somebody who does procurement sure. within the system. Procurement is a problem. and. To give you an idea of, of how we addressed it as a pilot program was in 2010, we had three projects going and we needed to kickstart the economy. So what we did was we said we would find shovel-ready projects. Shovel-ready projects were 
all within the university system. In other words, the EIS, everything was done, sites were selected, it was just funding. But we needed to, to get money flowing. And construction, as you know, is always the best multiplier that we have. So it was the Cancer Research Center in Kaka'ako, right down the road. It was uh, UH West Oahu. And the third one was the College of Hawaiian Language at the University of Hawaii, uh, Hilo. So in addition to that, we passed a pilot program because we said it would be just nonsensical for us to, to do these and have a challenge. The reason why we knew we needed to do a, do a reform of the procurement system is because Windward Community College had a library that was stalled because someone filed a challenge on a $10,000 lock. Okay, I, I, these are things that you have right. been involved in the past. Right. Is there something you would do that needs to be done now, should you become Well, governor? I think it's very similar to that. What we need to do is, in that particular case, it was a five-year pilot, and the UH, all those structures got built with no challenges, because we made it very clear to then President Marcy Greenwood, anyone challenges, you pay. Okay. So you do this right. And I think that that's the problem, is that we, we just assume everybody's gonna cheat. As opposed to why do we yeah. assume that everyone's going to cheat? Why because do we live in a state where we have that kind of assumption? I think I think it's because when when we it's 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 almost um, human nature that what we do is we react to something that's bad. We always do that, and you know what we we need to have maybe not necessarily more faith, but we need to have a structure where if if it's done right, there's there's no reason why like like the the waiver of the injunctive relief. Not that you can't challenge. It was the waiver of the injunctive relief that would stop a project. That's okay. what the- A related was. question, uh, this legislation died, uh, a state airport corporation, uh, you must agree, Honolulu International Airport, now Daniel K. Inouye International Airport, is not in the greatest shape. It has been mm -hmm. the way for a long time. It pales in comparison not only to international airports across the world, but many in our own uh, mainland. What would you do, I, I think, to improve uh, the, the infrastructure problem that we have, particularly the airports? What about a state or airport corporation? Would that be the best route? You know, the airport corporation may, may be something that we are going to have to look at, simply because this has gone too long. It almost made it out of the ledge, I believe, right. this last but time. But it, it's been there for three years. Yes, it has. And the, the problem is, and it's really more fundamental than that, you know, the, fu the fundamental issue is that why is it when airport modernization, yes, it was passed under Governor Lingle. That's right. But airport Harbors, too. And the Harbors, the highways, two. Yeah. So they were passed under Governor Lingle in 2009. And what happened, or 2008, 2009, and what happened was the subsequent administrations Both didn't Democrat. do it. Both Democrat didn't do anything. And, I'm, and I feel, and I feel that what we needed to do, and I hope that we can still do it, is we needed to implement those programs which the democratically controlled legislature actually passed. There's nothing wrong with not invented here. And I think that's our problem that we've seen in the administrations, is that not invented here, they start all over again. We can't do that. So I would, I would do that modernization. And as you know, even in harbors, back in 2009, they floated the necessary bonds and didn't start to even try to use it till now. And then I take a look at the Alawai small boat harbor and go, oh boy. But Joe, talking about the Alawai, you do know the one thing we did do was we did you talk about climate change is that there is in law, federal law, 345 million to do the watershed protection of the Alawai, which is going to now save Hamilton Yes, Library. we reported that on Civil, right. uh, Civil B right. recently, particularly the concern about flooding. We're in the last 10 minutes here with our interview uh, with uh, Representative Colleen Hanabusa, candidate for governor. This uh, particular note card has some sort of illustration on it. I'm not sure what it is. Yeah. It looks, looks like, like an outfit of some sort. I, I can't. It, oh, look, there's one on the other side, too, as well. You're talking about my attire? <laughs> I don't know. I okay. don't think it's making a judgment on that. The question, however, is a serious one. According to a recent article in the Star Advertiser, foreign investors increase how housing prices in Oahu with Canada, Australia, Germany, Japan, and UK leading the pack. Do you support legislation that would ban or limit foreign investors from purchasing real estate that would be in an effort to keep the housing prices down for our local population? You know, I think that the, uh, that's, that's, that is something that we need to, to look at. And I'm not sure how it would be done 
because it depends on who is purchasing it. So, but clearly the one thing that we shouldn't have, and but it comes down to entities such as HCDA, right? When you well, community development authority, which basically is a state agency that controls part of the city, right? Kakaako. It, it trumps the city. Trumps so, the city. Sorry, yeah. sorry to put it that way, but it trumps the city. So Trump is a verb. I yes. know it's a verb. <laughs> it, it means something I to everyone. It. <laughs> so it trumps the city, and yet those huge condos that are and I and I actually got a tour of one. I couldn't believe it. 36th floor, $36 million, and 35th floor, $35 million. And my question was, who in Hawaii mm. is going to buy this? Mm. You know, I mean, I can't even... I didn't even want to step into it because I didn't. <laughs> I didn't want to break anything. Is that something you might actually look at, though, in terms of course, of, of course, uh, it's legislation. something we have to look at it, and and we have to we have to come to the analysis because we don't want empty condos all over this place either. That doesn't help our economy. So it, it would be a matter of of maybe a foreign if somebody from a foreign country is going to live here, that may be different just doesn't have the rather than just right. using it as a, I don't know, a snowbird right. population right. or and so forth and that's why you need to take care of airbnb we have and we could <laughs> talk forever about that when we don't have time i do have to finish a couple more questions okay. and then we're pal oh boy you're gonna love this one are there any accomplishments or successes by governor Ige that you would build upon as a potential future governor you know what i'd like to um what i'd like to build upon and i'm not sure that necessarily they are clear successes, but I think that they're getting there, is we have to, we have to modernize all the computer systems in the state. It, we gotta do that, and I, and I think it's a matter of, you know, we have to ensure that it continues the way it, it really has it. And one of the things that I'm very concerned about now is, uh, for example, payroll. You know, there's an issue that I became aware of. And this is the government payroll, the correct? The government yeah. payroll, because we're talking about what a sure. governor would do, right? right? And, and the governor has to be very cognizant of, for example, what, and making sure that the people who are doing the work get paid on time. And, you know, like I just uh, learned, I got a, an email from someone and we're, we're trying to explore it, is that the National Guards who were sent to um, Big Island are, are not going to, haven't gotten paid. And I think someone said, and I don't know who it is, and we're trying to track it down, said, well, they knew they wouldn't get paid for three months. And, and, and the, the families are putting mortgages on credit cards. And they're saying, why, you know, why are we doing this? We're doing a service and yet the government isn't paying. And I understand from what I have been able to look in, this is because they do it manually. I mean, that's... That's not right. And so I want to build on the reforms that he has initiated, especially on payroll. And you know, and the other thing that um, also needs to be looked at is when we have this new Supreme Court case of Janice, right? right. So are people's getting their dues deducted right. appropriately? And then there's a whole issue the about that. The concern about this is going to hurt, particularly the public sector unions. You know, we're down the last five minutes here, and um, there's a million questions we could possibly get to. I do want you to let you know that Civil Beat has Representative Hanabusa's candidate Q&A up on our website. We have uh, many stories about her campaign issues. Please uh, check them out. She's also can be found on her own Facebook page and her own website. I'm going to ask this last question, and then I'm going to uh, close with just a few remarks. Uh, back to your website again. It says, living wages for everyone. That's what you want. What, what does that mean, living wage for everyone? Our minimum wage is $10.10. And 10 cents. Right. Do you mean 15? Do you mean 20? You know, living wage is a, means something. And it doesn't necessarily, and, and to be honest, I'm not sure how we would implement it uh, in, in terms of different counties, but the living wage on each of our counties are different. And the living wage is really the wage that a person needs for a family of four. Which I believe be it's well above $20 an hour. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Well, if you believe DBED, DBED has a, a, a list as to what it is. I have always uh, been an advocate of the living wage because I believe that if we're going to be aspirational and we're going to actually take care of our people, the only way they can do it in Hawaii is they need 
a living wage. And I'm not sure, some say that for Honolulu, the living, and this is DBET again, some, some said that for living wage in Honolulu, I think it's $15.75 or hmm. something. But they also said that it's not as high for some of the other items. Well, would you push for that? As you know, it's been difficult to get minimum wage hikes at the legislature. The Chamber of Commerce in particular fights that tooth and nail to say nothing about the tipping credit. But would you push for at minimum a $15, a $5 increase to the minimum wage? I, w I would push for that. And whether or not we'll be able to get it through at one time right. would be another issue. Probably, uh, the, right. generally they've staggered it right. and brought it in. in because a, I, a I did the minimum wage increase to $7 and something, believe it or not, when, when that happened. It's hard so to believe it was that low. It's uh, one uh, right, wow. yeah, but that's what I mean. Okay. But it, even then we knew living wage was $11. <laughs> well, thank you very much for very joining welcome. us today. Yeah, come on, you can give up a round of applause. <laughs> I also want to say a big mahalo to Hawaii Pacific University. That's where we are right now uh, with this broadcast. A reminder about upcoming events. We have now interviewed not only Congressman Hanabusa, but Ray LaRue, uh, the Republican candidate, and also John Carroll last night, who was in, in your seat as well. Uh, Governor David Ige will be in your seat. I believe the same room. Is that correct, Anthony? August the 1st, that is next week, and Representative Andrea Tapola, the minority leader in the House, will be here uh, the day after August 2nd. For more information, you can pick up a handout and visit us online at civilbeat.org for full elections coverage, and most important of all, remember to vote. It's August the 11th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chad.